Hi, everyone. Good evening. How are you? I hope you all had a long, restful weekend. Thank you for being here. I know it's hard to like motivate after a holiday weekend, but it's, uh, it's really good to see all of your faces. Um, we're so excited to have this extraordinary program to offer tonight. Um, of course, we're so glad that it's in this beautiful space in the Africa Center. So thank you to them for being such wonderful partners. Um, did everyone get a chance to see the exhibition? Fantastic. Um, if not, please come back. We're open Wednesday through Sunday. We will be open through July. And we only have actually one more program in this space that we're doing. It's going to be a week from today, Tuesday, June 7th. It's with Nicole Taylor. Uh, she has a beautiful new cookbook all about celebrating Juneteenth's uh, food traditions and legacies. She's going to be in conversation with Osai Endelin. So that's going to be Tuesday, June 7th at 7, our last partner program. I really hope you all can come back for that. Um, so MOFAD, we're the Museum of Food and Drink. Like I said, our exhibition here is through July. And additionally, we have programs all over the city. So I hope you'll sign up for our newsletter so you can come find us in other spaces, especially when we're no longer um, here with the exhibition. So tonight we have the most extraordinary panel. I couldn't be more excited. They all came from different parts of the country. Um, Adrienne Lipscomb, she's our moderator this evening. She's a chef, she's a farmer. She's the founder of 40 Acres. She's a brilliant academic. She's a mother. Her son is here tonight. Happy birthday to Aiden. Um, and then of course, Michael Twitty, which I'm sure some of you know, author, chef, culinary historian, extraordinaire, um, a new book coming out soon, Kosher Soul. Yes. <laughs> and also copies of the cooking gene um, that Michael wrote will be available for signing after the program. And then our friend Matthew Rayford come in and hot from Georgia. Um, he's a chef farmer. He's a chef. He's a farmer. What doesn't he do? He wrote the book Bress and Neum. It is here available for signing and purchase as well after the program. Um, so we're going to have some wine, some beer, some food from Field Trip, which is an awesome uh, rice restaurant from Chef JJ Johnson. We'll have that after the program. So obviously stick around and enjoy. Adrian, it's all you. Hello. Oh, there we go. Just Thank y'all so much for coming in. I know, don't scoot back. Y'all might get a show. <laughs> well, thank y'all so much for coming tonight. First of all, it's hot. I don't know how y'all do it here in New York. I know it's going to be cool tomorrow. I, I came from Texas, right? So, but y'all got a different type of heat. So let me just go ahead and say that. Um, thank y'all for coming here tonight. Thank you to my brothers for being here. Um, this conversation did not start yesterday. It didn't start a year ago, it's been centuries, uh, this conversation has been going on. And I am really blessed to be here with you too, uh, to talk about communal hands, talk about something that we don't talk about enough, and that is with farmers, caterers, and cooks. We got a little feedback here, how are we doing? We want a little bit. Um, I first wanted to kind of kick, kick off as, um, you know, as a chef, as a chef, um, a lot of us started as cooks. Um, a lot of us have started off as farmers or gardeners in some which nature in our family or in generations of our family and ancestors. How is it today? So I'm gonna start present time. How is it today that you were staying connected with those with the with the ground with the farmers <laughs> with the with the farmers um and what what are those steps that that makes them a part of your plate well in my particular case um land's been in my family since 1874 i'm the sixth generation to be on it farming um when i left i swore i'd never come back um because i was raised in the south deep south um southeast georgia and um, one of the things I did know growing up was that um, food within a community is very important. So one of the things that I, I talked about was that the monocropping of farming, I didn't quite get until I became an adult because I would, we would take a five gallon bucket and go and get sweet potatoes from one of our neighbors. They would come to us and get the crook neck squash. So it was always this kind of like bartering thing that was being done. And it wasn't like one or two potatoes or tomato. It was like enough to cook, you know, sweet potato pie from 
October to December, that kind of a thing, all right? So you weren't just going to just get a few of anything. And so even canning was a communal thing. Um, you always went to somebody's grandma's house can, like my, my grandmother was known for canning pears, sand pears, um, the ones that kind of like scratchy on the outside, but kind of juicy on the inside, real firm. They make really good preserves. And so everybody would come and bring all of their pears that they had to her house but we would always take all the tomatoes to somebody else's. Now that didn't quite formulate in my head till I became an adult, what was actually happening. I just always thought the Twitties make better, you know, marinara than we do. So that's why we go to day house. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's kind of how I thought about it. And now you see it completely as like a new way of life almost. And so farming and, and, and cooking has always been kind of a, a hand in hand thing, but just within our communities, uh, you know, because I'm definitely saying within the communal hand thought process, it was a constant thing, but no one did one thing. You know what I'm saying? Like you were known for doing one thing, but you were also growing for the whole community. You were talking a lot about culture, and that's what I'm going to bring Michael in about. And um, this this was a culture. This was this was a way of life that especially in the South, deep South, and even, even in Texas, this is something that I was really well known that my family also did too, um, when it came to farming and seeing the peach preserves, we had peach preserves. So we were, we were the peach preserve family. Y'all came and got peaches from us. And, um, the aspect of how we carry it on today in our kitchen as a chef is what I'm interested in. So how, you know, culturally, how we brought in our story, from our generations, you said six generations or more, into the kitchen as a chef. How do you bring that forward? But also culturally, how does that affect affect us as we move forward in history? So, um, where do I start? So, one, the first thing to realize is that what we're describing is meta-African. It's Caribbean, it's Afro-Latin, it's Haitian, it's Brazilian, it's African diaspora, it's Afro-Atlantic, it's African. And if you all see the, the, the whole hullabaloo about the Swedes not feeding you, like, it's like, and we look at the map of the countries in Europe where people share food, all the countries bordering Africa is where it's like, you're absolutely gonna eat when you come to our house. So even somebody asked, what, what, what does West Africa look like? Che, just like this one, this one. So that's one of the things that we talked about before we came to this stage was how do we inform each other about these stories? This looks effortless. There's so much information. Do you know why? Because we do this. This isn't something that until our generation, generation before us was even recorded. I remember going to Gilliard Farms. Remember that a long time ago, 2012. 2012, yeah, and I remember sitting that. Sitting with this gentleman, going through all the different crops, learning things. By the way, I put oyster shells in my garden to get rid of the nematodes, like you told yes, me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So Here we go. That's all those old enough. Things that you know, you, 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 there's no Google Books for this, okay? And so this part of the scholarship and part of the arch archiving of this is this constant sort of rescue effort. And I'm gonna be real with you. Zora Neale Hurston did this. Other people did this. But when it comes to really centering these narratives on food and telling our stories, but also informing you know, people who are great migration generations. Our family was the bread. You know, I used to literally sit in the corner of our kitchen in DC Grandmother's making this, this potato bread, yeast bread, whatever you want to call it, light bread as we call it in the South. And feeding, feeding the entire neighborhood, the people who were there, um, their past neighbors, the cousins next door, all, all of, I'm crying because I think all the bread belongs to me. <laughs> and so she gives me the bread, I shut up, I keep like crocodile tears smiling. And so that kind of, you learned very early on your table belongs to your village and your village is welcome at your table. And so 
bringing it full circle, Adrian, part of the conundrum of recording our stories, recording our culture, is making sure that people know that that deep memory, that deep culture, they're, they're not always footnotes for that. There's not always this cold Germanic scholarship that answers to the question of what is black food? People say, what is, what is black food? What is the black food culture? What do you mean black? Food can't have a color. A mask can have a color or phenotype. But I know where the heart is. I know what the source code is. And if I know that, if I know the feeling, that's the last part. If you can't feel it in our culture, you don't know it. Other folks, they say, huh, feeling, feeling, remember feelings don't matter. Feelings not facts. To us, feelings are facts. There you go. <laughs> um, so you brought up a lot of things that I wanted to tap on and I'm gonna bring up a little bit of an example. So I go to my grandmother's house. It can be my Nana's, I can go any Sunday and she doesn't even know we're coming, but there always will be enough food. Mm -hmm. there, will all, there will always be enough food to feed every head that sits at that table. And then you go beyond that to my great grandmother. Same thing. We could drive, we drove 200 miles. She may not know we're coming or may know we're coming. There's always going to be enough food because she'll feed beyond who sits at her table. She'll feed her block, her community. And then if we go on beyond that and we start thinking, what were their jobs? What were they doing before? When they were enslaved, what were they doing? And how did we get here? And what were we brought here for? And it was for the tools and the expertise of farming, of cooking, of working and understanding languages. They called us savages. So they were like, well, you will see other savages and you will communicate with those savages and work with, work with the community because we were communal because as they came to us, we still had open arms and we tried to feed them too. So there's this whole aspect of coming back and sharing and, and being with food. And as I'm gonna shift us all back forward, I'm gonna shift us to about 1800s. So let's go into the 1800s. And we're talking about freedom. So emancipation, quote unquote. And we're talking about now we are able to get jobs. And what jobs do we go for? Usually within the tool range of what we know from generations of being taught. So what your great grandmother, if she was in the kitchen, you were in the kitchen too. So now that we're here, how did we get to owning restaurants? How did we get to feeding people of other ethnicities and other colors and setting up tables? Because I think what people kind of forget is that some of these cities in the North and even in Texas, they were not segregated at this time. A lot of places were opening up restaurants that were right next to white restaurants and they were still serving everyone. How, how do we work at this point that we may have land or may be sharecroppers, a lot of a whole percentage of us were sharecroppers. How did we get from the farm to the restaurant? We were already there. Thank you. We were already in these urban centers, New York, Philadelphia, Boston, Buffalo. We keep going. Baltimore, Savannah, Charleston. Go that way. The mic up a little. Oh, right up. Okay, thank you. And the bottom line is this. <clears throat> I'm going to put it the only way I can put it. Before the Italians, before the Chinese, before the Mexicans, before the Greeks, we were the exotic restaurant experience, both the exotic and the familiar. We were the, we, we had absorbed, we were great absorbers, you know. We, we, the, the genius of us is that we blackify things. We absorb things and then spit it right back to you. And you'd be like, oh wow, look what they did. When we didn't have no ham in Africa, we didn't have no macaroni and cheese in Africa. But we made you believe that only us could do it. Genius. And then we took the okra, which I assure you, no Englishman, no Scotsman, no you know, former felon of Newgate prison ever had before they set foot on these shores. So that by 1760, Peter Calm 
Swedish writer is talking about everybody here, white and, white and black eats okra. You know, that's, that's deep, that's deep. So we were the caterers, we were the tavern owners, we were Samuel Francis, mixed man of color from the West Indies, whose daughter saves Washington's a life, that his tavern keeps him from being poisoned, where the, the, the Monticello folks we talked about before and beyond. And there's this one, there's this one reference before I, we bounce to Nancy. Um, it's called, it was a girl's life before the war. It was from a Virginia, you know, Belle. And she talks about, there was a wedding in Washington, DC. And contextually, she's like, oh yeah, we went to the caterer. The caterer is obviously black, but she never says the word black or Negro or colored. But you know he is a black man. And he is insisting on the Charlotte Russ and the high, you know, the this and the, the very height of this Anglo-Franco cuisine was very popular. So the whole idea is, and I learned this from our, our dear brother Kevin as well, is that if you look at all these advertisements for enslaved um, cooks and pastry makers and caterers and bakers and realize there were free people of color also advertising for the labor of enslaved children. Why? Probably with a little bit of altruism, you should hope, so that they could train them up, they could have an actual profession and they could get themselves free. So when they were free, they would be indispensable because we were indispensable. There was, no, there was no such thing as, well, go to the white people, maybe the black, no, we were the cooks. You know, I, I, got, I need to say two things because I'm looking over at my book from while we're talking and, um, and maybe we might've briefly spoke about this in, in, in passing. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go a little bit backwards to move forward. And so uh, I have, um, when I came out with my book, Bless and Yam, which means bless and eat in Gullah Geechee, I've had a few people say to me, so we never ever heard you talk about being Gullah Geechee. How did that happen? How did you go from being this cook and or chef to now be talking about who and what you are? And I said, I've always talked about who and what I was, but when I tried to explain it, people were like, I don't, I don't get it. So I just be like, oh, I'm from the South. Just leave it at that. It's easier for you to digest. And whatever is palatable for you at the moment is great. And the other thing, too, was, was I remember when I first became a caterer, there were people that consistently tried to relegate me into the macaroni and cheese fried chicken era. And I was not willing to do that. I already knew how to do that. I was like, I want to do some other stuff. And what then became a really ugly point in time within my catering life, and I can say this out loud, and I've told people about this before, if you ordered anything that resembled soul food, you paid a higher premium if you came to our catering company. So you didn't pay $25 for the meal. It was more like 50 because you got me cooking things that you think that I'm only capable of. So then you need to pay me for that expertise, if that's where you think I'm, if that's what you want to relegate me to. And so I did that as a caterer when I very first started because my original name of my catering company was La Creme, the cream. And I actually had someone come to me and say, you know, you should change the name of your company, you probably get more business. And I said, what, what should I change it to? And they said, cooking it up. And I said, well, well, wait. So the cream has me in a very specific, you know, that's the what's in the name kind of a thing. And you want to relegate me to cooking it up. And I started realizing that words have a lot of power within our culture that we've allowed sometimes to just take over. Um, even the word soul food, even the word black folk food, all those things are like, them pushing you into an area that we, if I grow the food, know how to grow the food, know how to take care of the soil. Organics was already built into us. That's all we did from the very beginning. We didn't start off with chemicals. Matter of fact, most of us, even when we got big farms, didn't use chemicals because we weren't allowed to buy the chemicals. So now we talk about global warming and all those things. That's why I said I need to go back a little bit to come forward is that 
now people are trying to get that knowledge that we have done on cooking and agriculture and aquaculture and ranching, all those things. Now they're trying to extrapolate that information from us, especially when they're starting to find out where they learn those things. Like when I talk to someone of like strong Italian descent and I start talking about things like, oh, you know, they had that in West Africa like 2000 years before y'all started doing that. And they're like, whoa, whoa, wait. You know, it's like finding out beer. Beer being something that had been done in Africa, perfected in Africa, to now just starting to have enough African-Americans that are brewers. We're so far behind, right? But no, we're not. We were already doing it. And if you really think about it, people are still coming to us to ask for this knowledge. And it's not just about uh, Southern food, even though that's getting ready to be, that, that Southern food is going to stay a trend. I just want everybody here to know that Black food, soul food is not going to leave for another decade. Let me tell you why. Because for the last decade, it's been the primary food thing that has happened. It's changed a lot, as in now people are talking about the diaspora of our food. But besides that, anything that's Black, Black everything, when it comes to food, because we are growing it, we're growing hibiscus, we're growing rice, we're growing sweet potato. And we're not talking like an acre. We're talking multiple acres. So that's where I see us. I think what's really pretty awesome about what you do, what I do and what a couple other people do is that we're just not cooking. We're going back to the land and we want to go back to the roots. So really understanding how do we get it to the plate? Um, I want to talk about catering because you did bring that up. And that's one subject that does not get talked about enough. Uh, you know, there were black caterers in 1865, 1855 early 1800s that were free black caterers um, in major cities. My wife reminds me of that every time we go to Philly. And especially Philly. And then in Charleston also, not Fuller. Um, you're, looking at, you're looking at these chefs and caterers that were prominent. They were doing large dinners, governmental dinners, in fact. Um, and... I went back and I dug deep after our conversation, I was in a rabbit hole because I was trying to understand like, how did they move all these plates? How did they move, you know, cause it wasn't just stationed in one spot, it was all over. And what I saw was communal. They were borrowing. They were borrowing from other restaurants. They were borrowing um, knives from this restaurant, plates from this other restaurant and, and creating events. So not just, having dinners, they were creating full events and experiences by working together. So I see our culture going beyond just coming to the table, but we're bringing other experts to the table to make certain recipes that they can't make that that client may ask for. They're going to other people and they're bringing it into the business. So it's creating a larger economy. And I'm starting to see that again in all the collabs. Are you, have y'all been to a collab dinner between a rest, a collab dinner between a pop-up dinner? Yeah. You're starting to see a lot of those starting to happen again. And then also they're bringing in the farmers. And one question I know we had together was those black caterers in the 1800s, who are they using? Black farmers. That's all, they, no white farmer was going to sell a black person anything for them to have a come up so they had to go to black farmers to have that conversation and they had to grow it like very similar to when you think about a chef now going to a farm having the conversation you got to grow it for the whole season it means your thing is booked it means your restaurant is going to be doing this thing so they're not ordering a pound of green beans once a week they're ordering pounds of green beans for the season and which is was the also the way that the community from the economic standpoint that you're talking continued to grow and if you look at you know the Ida B Wells and like when you start looking at all those people there were it wasn't just food like food then moved on to hair hair moved on to the fashion you know like all those things were interconnected because how do you have an event without a chef without cooks without uh, having facilities, 
right? Because they were decorating these facilities. This was full pomp and circumstance when they catered. There was no, uh, you ever went to a friend's house that every time you go to their house to hang out, it seemed like they went over the top for every little thing. That's what those black caterers were like. They went over the top because that is what they did, not because for pomp and circumstance, they were doing it because that's what we do. We don't half do anything. We don't half cook sweet potato pie, you know? And now bringing it forward, present time, we still do that. We still work with our farmers. We still work with other chefs. We collaborate. We have Black food and wine festivals now. We are now looking at more pop-ups, more storytelling um, in our food. But also, like I said, in that story of our food, we're talking about the farmer. We're bringing them forward. We're talking about the caterers. We're talking about the history of the ingredients. And moving that forward, where do you think we're going to be in the next five years? We have to... Well, we have to collectively understand something. Number one, we are losing narratives by the thousands every day. We have to, we have to get all of our folks. That means the black farmers from the South. It means the great migration generations. It means people who were part of the first, second, and third waves Caribbean immigrants. It means African immigrant migration. You know, um, one thing I got out of that awful disaster that happened the past year was that these food narratives matter too. Because they're obviously, because why were we there together? Because we had no choice but to work with each other. It's the August Wilson thing, right? Well, well why, would you, why would you want us to go back to that? Because we were a community, because we worked together. We relied on each other. We had cooperative economics, but also cooperative groupthink. And so getting the narratives is one thing, understanding how to push them forward. You know, we talk about African-American heirlooms. I helped popularize the fish pepper. But here's the thing, you never would have known that had not there been a bigger conversation about who's growing this, what their narrative is. There were people out there who were saying the fish pepper was Thai. I'm like, you don't look tired of me. Don't, no, 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 no issue. I like Thai. But you don't look like a Thai pepper to me. You look like one of us. So what does that mean? It means you really have to dig deep, create records. Um, one of the projects that I'm working with at Colonial Williamsburg that I'm starting is to document every single one of these 17 through 1820 early African-American ingredients. Um, varieties of vegetables, you know, types of fish. Why were certain fish you could use the tail? What season was it caught in? That matters too. You couldn't catch everything all the time. What season does this vegetable grow in? How do we know it was there? Because somebody will say, well, how do you know? But we'll then go around the corner and then make a whole business out of some lies. You, let me, I, I, gotta, I gotta come in come with on. this. So I was in Torino, Italy. 20, the same year you and I connected. I'm in Italy. And by the way, and I, what were you doing in Italy? Come on. I, I was at, I was at, uh, <laughs> I was at uh, Terra Madra for Slow Food. Representing, um, re representing the United States um, as a black farmer. Um, thank you. Um, but I, I'm walking around and I'm, I'm kind of animated anyway. So I got to do this animated. I walk around, I see this big giant poster and I'm looking at it and I'm like, mullet? Okay, I'll, I'll bite mullet. What country is talking about mullet? Gray mullet. Anybody know what mullet looks like? Okay, so hold on. I walk over and this lady says, would you like to taste this? And I was like, no. And she was like, uh, I mean, she was hurt. Cause I said no offensively. Like, why would you ask me if I want to taste this ish? And she was like, oh, you know, she starts talking to me about the process. And I said, this is mullet row, right? And she goes, yeah. I said, just out of curiosity, how much you sell that for? She goes, oh, this piece, which is no bigger than this, 
about the same size round was $200. So I said, what kind of wax is coating this thing? And she goes, oh, it's just a plain wax that we just have. You know, we take the mullet, we smoke it, we dip it in it, and then it, it kind of ferments inside of it. So I walked back to my booth and I said, I talked to everybody in the booth and I said, has anybody ever had mullet roll? And you know, everybody was like, oh my God. Yeah, my grandma used to fry that up all the time. Like it was just like this horrible face, right? And I said, did you know that they selling mullet roll for $200 right there? And they were like, whoa, 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 wait, wait. I said, go look at the thing. It's the same mullet that I catch in Brunswick, Georgia, right in the little inlet that we snatch. And I had no idea because when I came back to the United States, I'm telling people about mullet row. I'm telling people about mullet. They use mullet as a trash fish to catch tuna. Right. So my very first restaurant, I put fried mullet on the menu. And all I called it was local fried fish. Because I knew if I said mullet, everybody's connotation would be like, oh my God. Do you know that we sold 300 pounds of mullet filet our first week. Nobody knew what it was. When people would come be like, oh, what is it? I'd be like, mullet. They stop lying. That can't be mullet. People have gotten us to believe that some of the foods that we have been eating, grew up on, blah, 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 is less than. However, I'm here in Harlem and y'all selling shrimp and grits for $34 a plate. Can I talk about some oxtails? No. Do you know I talked to can I talk about some oxtail? oxtails? $50 per whatever. Chicken I was wings. like, but chicken, when wings. Did, chicken wings. What, when, when did the po' folk food become the most expensive food ever? So this was a question that I got. Um, no, you were, so, you were so good. So I'm starting to see chitlins on the menu. Yes. All, all around. Yes. But they're, uh, they're called um, intestines. They, you know, they're making it look really beautiful yeah. on these terms. And, you know, I'm going, I'm, I, I work with farmers and the farmers are asking me, why are y'all asking for all of this? Y'all never right. asked for it before. I said, I ain't asking for it. I know I don't want it. Right. But they, they can't keep it. They, they can't keep it. They can't sell it to their regular customers. They can't sell it to. They don't even have enough of it. They don't even have enough of it. So I'm always wondering, I always have the question is like, are we losing the culture because we can't even afford to, to do the culture? So here's one of the things right over there is the most cookbooks I've ever seen from people that look like me, walk like me and talk like me in one place ever right in here. Right. There was something that you said was sitting there and I was like, God, I hope they open it up so I can say this. We're orators. We talk our thing through writing we ain't got to do that because I can tell any of you all a recipe and please believe when y'all walk up out this camp, y'all not going to want to forget it. You might write some of it down. You might chicken scratch it, but you're going to remember it because we talk to each other. If you look through my book, half of those recipes were recipes I had to then figure out how to write it for you. Right. I knew how to, I understood what my grandma and them said, but nobody else did. And my dad, when he was a baker, in the late 50s, early 60s, he had dyslexia. That was not a word, wasn't used. So they called him slow, they called him retarded, they called him stupid. But he was a master baker at 18, measuring with his hands. So one of the things, we're not losing the culture. What's happening is we have to figure out a better way to keep the culture being known. Writing is just the beginning. Podcasts are getting stronger. We, we, listen, we have a different way. Mm -hmm. we, have to ha we have a different source code. Mm -hmm. Everybody else does their thing on their terms, okay? It doesn't look the standard way, you know? So I'll give you an example, a quick example. In Jewish tradition, part of our script tradition isn't you know, the thou shalt, thou shalt not viable. It's arguments, because we know how to argue. <laughs> and the argument, you know, the Bible, the Babylonian Talmud and the Yerushalmi are composed, 70% of it are 
arguments between rabbis that have no conclusion. It isn't dictation, it is having the conversation and what's, what's magical is that then on that same page, joining the people who lived you know, 200 years after the time of Jesus are people who lived in the Middle Ages and then later in the 19th century and then even responsive from the 21st century. So everybody has their thing. Everybody does it according to their will. You know whose cookbook I love probably the most? Princess Pamela. You know why? Because it's just like what you said. You know, when we write cookbooks these days, the expectation of cookbook editor is that we will do it like a New York Times recipe. Every single little thing. I'm just like, why do I have to tell you that? Don't you know? Come now. Listen. See, I changed this night, Jack. What, what, what are you, why do we have to do, what, you know what I mean when I say this. It's like when the recipes and culture soul, to my friend from Toronto, who's Jamaican, Canadian, and she says in the recipe, look, I want, you could use canned kidney beans, but why would you, question mark, question mark, question mark. Editor goes, that's kind of offensive and kind of abrasive. I'm like, no, it's Jamaican. <laughs> And she's saying it the way she feels it. You know, not everything is a, we, we always, I've watched you cook. I've watched you cook. Not everything with us is an is a exact measurement. That's not our culture. It's not our way. I've been, I've been, what, eight countries in West Africa. I ain't never seen a spoon come out. <laughs> and that's just tell you how much to put in. When they tell you to stop, you stop. I, you, you, all of us have had that feeling when we've had a, a relative who's passed on, literally tell us, I'm not, and this is not a joke, this is, this is for real. Literally over your shoulder be like, okay, you, but you forgot the lemon juice. Where the hell is that coming from? Is that, no. Right? Up like an elevator of the soul, how you cook. And I want that honored. I want that process honored on its own terms without having to translate that into, you know, gourmet foodie cook speak. <laughs> there is, there's something, there's something magical that you lose. And if you respect this in your Korean kitchen and you respect this in an Italian kitchen, respect it in our kitchen and our culture. So the bottom line is with these ingredients, are we losing them? Well, here's the thing. You have to cultivate a taste. What I found is that people watch the luminaries, who I have respect for, on TV eating opal and eating funky things. Why don't we have, why don't a lot of us have that taste? It's because of class and caste reasons that we don't. You know, it's, it's because, you know, we could enjoy them. But I think a lot of a lot of us, we ate so much mullet row and so much rabbit and so much this and so much that that we promised ourselves I ain't eat no more. I ain't never gonna eat no more of it. But there has to be also a way to say, you know what, I may not dig that all the time, but I'm gonna keep it a part of my tradition. My mother used to make black eyed peas once a year after my grandmother passed. New Year's. I was a little pot. And I asked her. What do you make this little pot? Because I don't really like black eyed peas. And I said, but she said, I do it because of tradition. I do it because I don't want to lose the recipe. I do it because I want you to know how to make them. And that has to be good enough sometimes. I, th I think that you find, especially in my family, um, we didn't write recipes down. It was all oral. So how we got back with the family is if you couldn't remember something, you know, you, you call Nana or you call your sister and you ask, was that one tablespoon or one teaspoon? And they say, I don't know. And you know, they know, you know, they know, they ain't going to tell you. And then, and then you, you, you try, you may try it again. You may call them back and be like, teaspoon or tablespoon. They'd be like, I don't know. I'm not going to tell you. And then my grandmother would say, it seems that you haven't been home enough. So then that's, you know, that's me getting in my car, you know, driving down the road. Yep. And then going in the kitchen and she's sitting there waiting for me because she know we're going to make it together. 
Or something else that I, that has happened recently is she made my grandmother. I have to talk about her, my nana. When you are family, you don't enter in the front door. You enter into the garage because the garage connects to the kitchen. And you go into the kitchen and you say, hi, Nana, but you ain't looking at her. You're looking at the top of the refrigerator because you're looking at the cake pan because you know there's a cake up there. And if there's no cake, you look at the cookie jar. I've been doing this for some umpteen years. This is how, this is how the house works. And one time she made the cake and it didn't taste right. And you don't say nothing. You don't tell you don't say nothing. You know, I leaned over to my mom and I was like, this cake don't taste right. You know, and my mom's like, oh, what, what this cake tastes like? I was like, I ain't gonna say nothing. I'm gonna go home and eat this cake. So by the time I got home, my phone rang and my grandma said, what's wrong with my cake? And cause you know, my mom, she snitched. She snitched on me. Dry <laughs> snitch. She snitched on me. And that is the first time, and I probably was like 38, the first time that we ever said a recipe across the phone to each other back and forth going over it because my grandma was like no 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 she knew she made that cake right well we found a discrepancy right but it was my fault you know I put too much in she made it right so she's like make the cake so I made the cake and took her to her house you know she was sitting outside by the garage on the phone just looking at me she said take the cake inside didn't even eat it I was so proud I go home and she calls me and she said, you were right. I felt, I felt, I felt like the world, like I had the world. It was a champion. I got an award. The next day, my cousin calls me and said, what did you do? I went over and Nana didn't have the cake and said, I didn't have to make it anymore. So she wasn't going to make it anymore. She said, you ain't gonna make it anymore. I said, what? I said, what are you talking about? She goes, she said, you will make the cake from now on. Eat the cake at a man, eat the cake. And I was like, so I'm making the cake and I'm taking it over there constantly because now I got to make the cake because, but it's two parts, right? It's like, it's that torch has been kind of like passed over to the next generation. But you know, I'm still, you know, I'm making this cake, I'm gonna make this cake and take it home. But now it's like, everybody knows who to turn to when this cake is made, meaning everybody knows whose house to come to and know that they're always going to be welcome to, to my house because of this cake. So in, in part of it, I honored it, right? So this is something that I, I get chills right now just thinking about, it. but it was always oral and having that conversation with them. And it was always watching, right? Cause you didn't know if it was a teaspoon, a tablespoon, a smidgen. And you know, you seen those people talk about, it, you know, grandma as they writing it down, was it a teaspoon or a tablespoon? I don't know. But you know, there's a solution to this. I tell people, if you want a family recipe, the first thing you have to do is get real. Are you a carbon That's copy of your parents? Oh, no. Are you a carbon copy of no, your parents? No, sir. Genetically, biologically, mentally, intellectually, spiritually, you are not a carbon copy. You may come from your mom and daddy, but they are not a carbon copy of their people. So why do we expect that our recipes are going to be the exact same thing? We all put something in the pot. My grandmother, sweet potatoes, the Alabama way was very simple. You either use either alga or the other kind of ribbon or cane syrup, or you use white sugar, butter, and nutmeg. Nutmeg, not, not I was like, you know what? When I grow up, I'm gonna put some cinnamon, and some allspice. I done had some Jamaican sweet potato. I'm gonna put some a mental. So I did it. And guess what? <laughs> but it's okay. It's okay. Because every now and then I still make it the other way. Yeah. Just so I can show my younger cousins how it was done. But here's the deal. You do it three times. The first time, you, you, the watching thing is important. Mm -hmm. And you know, in Yoruba, the word to educate, iluti, means to hear and see. You can, you know, which, which is ableist a little bit, sorry. But are you watching or are you seeing? It's like this, was it like this one woman from um, the Foxfire books, one of the only black women in the Foxfire books. And they made a, a, a splint uh, oak basket. And they asked her, how, this is, this is a beautiful, perfect basket. How often do you make it? This is the first time I ever made it. But I did it because I watched my daddy all the time. So the first time is 
always bring in the groceries, always wash the dishes, always sweep the floor. Do not do this millennial Gen Z nonsense. Adrian, tell me how you make the cake. First of all, you're watching the wrong thing. You're watching the face, not the hands. The most important tools in the black kitchen are your hands. So how do you measure? My grandmother taught me. Give me, show me a teaspoon. And she was never brusque or abrasive with me. But when she taught me how to measure with my hands, she almost like, like to break my hands. Teaspoon, tablespoon, cup, like, right? You had the same thing. Yeah. And then like, and show me the pinch here. Okay, good. So then you, you kind of watch the hands, you do all the tasks, but you, you know, you, you, you do record, you do document. The second time, this is my little trick. You cooking that cake, especially the baked goods. Hey, let me hold that. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, you got your little teaspoon, tablespoon, cup, whatever, ready. It's not gonna be the exact way every single time, but now you have an approximate idea. And, and every single time you eat it with them and ask, does this taste right? What, what did you buy? Why don't you, why do you use this seasoning or that sugar? But did it, you know, all those questions. The last time you make it together, they make it the first time, you, then, then you handle it, then you make it together or you just make it. And you ask them, who taught you? Where'd you learn this from? When's the first time you had this? And then you have the youngins around so they can hear the stories too. But all the while knowing that it will not be the same from generation to generation. But at least the conversation is going, the hearing and the seeing is going, and all those other things that are part of the culture. And every single time, take out the trash, sweep the floor, wash the dishes, clean the vegetables, bring in the groceries and go to the store with them. Every single time. This works for every culture. Every culture, doesn't matter who. I did all that and then some, I had to. We were, we were forced to <laughs> clean the greens, do the peas and such, I mean, little till, till now. I think my son will tell you, I make him do, I cook too, right? I make you do things too, so you watch me. Um, one thing about communal and we talked oral, I wanna bring up church cookbooks because church cookbooks, especially black church cookbooks, I love them, I love them to death because you see that pinch you see that smidgen, you will even see, go get it from this farmer in this, you know, from Farmer Joe. Mm -hmm. You will see, you will see that. And we, we're losing that in cookbooks. We're losing that aspect of where, where we got this from, if you're really wanting the whole entire story, but also the name of the, of the person who did this certain recipe in allowing to have more than one of the same recipe in there potato salad, sweet potato pie, seven up cake. I could go on and on and on. How about Bible cake? Bible cake. I have the original Bible cake pan and the original scripture written recipe that my great grandmother gave to my grandmother, like the Bible pan, like it's shaped like a Bible, like, I'm, and it's been sitting. So my, that has to be one of the things I put in my next cookbook is because there are so many things that we that we don't get a chance to like really put into play. And I like that. More than one potato salad recipe, more than one sweet potato pie recipe, more than one of anything, you know, and, and setting it up so that people understand. I'm gonna say this out loud. We are great cooks. Chefs, have a specific kind of title because of where they are within what they play on. Right here, you're looking at some of the most amazing cooks in the United States, not just chefs. Chefs is just a title, right? I know chefs that are not worth their salt and never will be, never. But once you're a good cook, there's something innate about how you carry, how you do, how you smell, how you taste. And this is what makes me proud to also and honored to be on the stage with you all. 
And I have to tell you, that's probably the nicest thing you ever said to me because we always fight. <laughs> but I'm going to wrap this up. So, and we are going to have some questions and answer sessions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. We will bring a mic to you. Oh, there's one popped right up there. Like popcorn just popped right up. Oh, she was Thank ready. You. Hi, Mr. Twitty. We actually met in Brooklyn. I had the two two boys, the two six year olds, the crazies. Yeah. So that was <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, everything you guys just said just went through my head. My grandmother, my mom, my great grandmother. So when my mom passed, I was 28. I didn't have her sweet potato pie recipe for Thanksgiving. I was freaking out. I found it. It was like finding gold. Almost. Mm -hmm. I have my grandmother's uh, cast iron. Mm -hmm. I still have my grandmother's big, excuse my French, big ass pot. Yeah, that's, that's one way to say it. That she did, <laughs> she did her um, corned beef in, mm -hmm. that she did her pork chops in, that she did her shrimp egg foo young in. So mm -hmm. I have all that. My little, my, now one of my twins, he's been asking me to watch. I mean, he knows what mise en place is. He knows how to use a knife almost. I garden like hardcore. I turn my front part of my front lawn into a garden, okay? I have two plots at each community garden. So I grow my own food. When everybody was panicking about the, you know, the- Toilet paper? Toilet paper. I was, I was like- I was gardening. Yeah, I was gardening. And I said, I'm not worried. If we have to go vegan, so be it. Cause I know how to cook. So my, I learned, I knew at a young age, I knew I was going to be a chef. I would see them, like my grandfather used to take us to Atlantic City and I'd see a chef and I was like, oh, oh, you know, I thought I was a rock star. So my dad had me in front of the oven at the age of six, cooking bacon. I remember it, cooking spam, cooking eggs. Now this, we're talking spam and eggs. You know, salmon cakes, all that stuff. Trafe. Yeah, and just, and chitlins, I remember, I remember all that stuff. And I still, to this day, make uh, black eyed peas on, I freaked out one year because I couldn't find any. I was like, I couldn't find the dry beans. And, I, and then one year I bought two bags and I kept one in the freezer. So, and, but I don't do them the same way as my family did. I do it my way. I do my collard greens my way. I grow my own collard greens, okay? I grow my own carrots. I grow my own everything. So my kids, when they're, you know, old, get as they're coming up, they will learn from, I'm now I'm a trained chef. From, I went to Johnson & Wales, but I learned how to cook in my house. And I don't want anyone to tell me that, oh, you don't do it that way. I was like, yeah, no. <laughs> You do it that way. My husband, who's a white guy, half Jewish, he said, I said, go get me some Crisco. He's like, what? I was like, Crisco, you know, the can. He's like, what? I was like, Dan? <laughs> so I had to show him the picture. And he, I was like, he bought me the small one. I was like, where's the large one? He's like, oh, they didn't have it. I was like, mm, very upset. Yeah. So yeah, I, have to, I have to relate to this is like, even with you saying this, I don't think my nana cooked the same way as my great grandmother no, cooked. No. I don't think my great grandmother cooked the same way as my great great grandmother well, cooked. Well, you know, the the things that have been consistently available for us as food, um, I mean, there are family members that I know still swear by Crisco, right? right? But there's a lot of other things that have come out you know, that we've learned how to do and manipulate and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's also because like my Nana didn't have Crisco until years later. My great grandmother never even knew what Crisco was. And then her mother was a slave. You know what I'm saying? Like when you start doing those kinds of things, you're like, well, shoot, how did they get the Crisco? Right. You know what I'm saying? How, like, did these, how did these recipes, well, first of all, the idea of a recipe is weird. Right. How did these foods and dishes change and they over time? Right. If you didn't have, if for example, everybody nudges me about pimento cheese. I'm like, I never heard of no damn pimento cheese until whatever. And they're like, how come? And I said, because my grandparents left Alabama during the Great Migration before World War II. There was no such thing 
in black food or southern food is pimento cheese then so it just that even that even that shows you the mark in time of what that is right and so there's like like so, so there's this expectation of certain things it's like our good friend chef and scholar Therese Nelson says she taught me something so outstanding and I quote her every single time there is black food the canon mm -hmm. and then there is black food the construct yep what my sister is saying, and by the way, I probably have the same tights on. Uh, what she is saying is there is black food, the construct. Right. In other words, the ingredients, the smell, the flavor, the color, the expectations, the communalism, the feeding other people, the variety, the newness. We are the improvisation jazz people, no matter where we go, right? Correct. So therefore, I don't want to hear people say things like, there ain't no collard greens. They ain't no jam by you know what's funny i haven't cooked collard greens with meat in it for 15 years like no meat at all and every time someone eats them they're like man what kind of meat you got in here i said there's 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 no meat they were like well, what kind of meat did you cook the juice in to make the, the i said there's no kind of meat and they're just and they're still trying to like walk their head through but my grandmama did it like this and it tastes the same. And I was like, well, it took me some years to get it to taste like this, but it doesn't have to have this thing in it. So there's also that, but I, I see there's another question. Yeah, so another I apologize. Question. So first of all, the Jews definitely love their Crisco because I use Crisco in my grandmother's black and white's recipe all the damn time. But I didn't know, I don't know exactly know when Crisco comes from. Like, I don't know the the history of Crisco, but I'm sure it's been used at least since like the 1930s, 1940s. Vegetable shortening has been around for a while. Um, second of all, Michael, when you were saying, you know, the hand, the the pinch, the thing, I know that my grandmother had the exact same thing, except she also had, because of course, my great grandmother, my great great grandmother, no one had teaspoons and cups and whatever in the old country or here. They had you, you were lucky if you had a juice glass, right? So the recipe for hamantaschen is three glasses of flour. Right. And it's like, what, um, uh, mom, what's a, what's a glass of flour? Uh, you know, oh, we, up, basically. right. Your, 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 well, your grandmother had these glasses. Maybe if you went to the store, you could find a glass that's that shape and size. And I'm like, can you draw me a picture? Like, what does that even, so whatever oral tradition was passed on to the actual written down recipe, which I guess, my mother and my aunts were trying to get her to write down just in case heaven forbid anything happened especially because two of the aunts can't cook anyway um you know my mother thankfully has the cooking gene and i i was lucky enough to get it as well um you know whatever passed through that is not is not something that you can really learn from an index card wrapped it up in a plastic bag right. you know like it's not it's it's you either can you either can do it or you can't you know you either have the taste to figure it out or you can't right so, you know, just a quick thing. Crisco was advertised in Yiddish as the fat the Jewish woman has been waiting for <laughs> for 3,500 years. Yes. Amazing. I love it. Amazing. But that Shitterine method in Yiddish, a little of this, a little that Shitterine, mm -hmm. is, is so common. But also, there, I, guess we, I guess the thing that gets me is that you go to see a Mandarin noodle maker, Mandarin speaking noodle maker, and that is mesmerizing. Mm. Because even though there's not really measurements, there is an exactness to it. And that moment when they take, when he takes the, that, that, those, the threads of noodles and goes, come like a multitude. Yeah. Damn. Sometimes I get jealous and I want to do that. <laughs> I want to do that, but yeah. ain't real. All right, chef, what you got? Every menu I was here today, yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was that directed directly to me? Oh, anybody? Okay. Well, so I'm, I'm going to tell you how I feel. Anybody can tell. Right. I feel that once I do it, it's mine. Um, I don't, I don't, I guess where my, my reclamation thing comes is, is, is not my litmus for it or whatever is not there because I, it's taken me a long time to get to this point. So don't nobody think I just, you know, I've been like this forever. It's taking me some time to understand that no one 
can do exactly what I do based on the conversation we're, we're having right now. I'm not saying that a chef can't duplicate a dish I do or whatever. I'm saying that I have a very specific thought process when I go to cook. And what's even more interesting is I actually originally learned the pinches, dashes, and drizzles as an amount. So I learned that within the glass thing, and there was a one in there, it was a three to one ratio. Same way with rice. I'll use rice as the most perfect thing. No matter what kind of rice you're cooking, right? It's used, not brown rice, but it's usually two to one, right? Two cups of water, one cup of rice. That's a ratio. Two to one. Pound cake. That's all ratios. And so that whole thing about us not being intelligent, that ratio, that mathematics is here. That's why the reclamation of what I have in here, no one can take away. I'm not arguing with anybody about shrimp and grits. You know why? That's what y'all want to do. Do it. I just know that where I come from, we do fish, stewed tomatoes, and okra. If we're going to put seafood on a plate and it's eaten for dinner only. You know, it's not something that's on the meal for you don't eat it at lunch. It's not lunch food. You wouldn't you would never eat that at lunch. And so there are things that I know to be my truths. It's taken me a long time to understand that my truths are mine. My wife's truths are hers. Our truths together are ours. And it works the same way with us up here. I believe that we have we all in this room, city, state, country, whatever you want to pull in. We all have our own truths. What we have to do is start understanding that we are humans and that your truth can be different from my truth and should. Yes. That makes us individuals, but we're still all humans. And if I respect what you do, I mean, I do talk shit about anybody that has shrimp and grits on their menu. I, mean, I, I mean, do. I, I don't I mean. care who it is. Once you pass the Mason Dixon line, I'm kind of like, uh, you got it on here because because black people don't eat that, but okay. You know what I'm saying? Like, and we damn sure ain't gonna pay $34 for it. Well, okay. well Chicken and waffles even worse. Well, well that's it, that's it. I don't know about nobody. No, I'm, I'm not saying nobody, but, but, but I it mean. Wasn't, but it was not, it's a special. Right, it's a special, thing. and $34? Right, right, nah. Like, nah, I can get, nah. I mean, where I live, shrimp is, four, what did you say it was the other day, babe? Four ninety nine a pound. So how do I get, Oh, and by the way, my wife and I argue about this because she comes from an Italian side of cooking. So when she talks about polenta, I say grits. Right. I say grits. She says polenta. It's the same thing. So, look, we don't have a lot of. We're just starting to see an entire crop of. Black centered food scholars from across the African Atlantic and African diaspora and the black world. Um, so why is this important? A lot of chefs sell their food based on a narrative, mm -hmm. a story. Thank you. You'll notice that the price point goes up based on the story behind that heirloom, whatever, and da 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 da, -da and this ingredient. And okay. That's one thing. I don't we we haven't really done that. I would rather do it to up the price point of hiring black chefs. Boom. So that's not, we're not the cheap eats anymore. Right. We're not, you know, that's what we're doing. So you look at, look, a perfect example is a mutual um, acquaintance, David Shields. Now David Shields um, and, and chef wrote a book about the foods of South Carolina. It's a really good book. But the thing is, until very recently, I mean, you know, I ain't gonna go there. But, you know, the perspective was of some of the earlier writing he was doing was very much, <laughs> I'm a white man writing about these gentlemen white chefs. Like you can't write about it without writing about us. And not just that, you can't write it without us. You have to be in community with us. These are our ancestors. You're not talking about just any old dead people. These are our people. And I'm glad that their evolution has taken place within him and other folks. But now when we write our own stories and write our own history, I'm looking at it through two, two different lenses. One is 
telling it as it's been told, and telling it in a way that it's unapproachable. That nobody can, nobody can say, you notice, know, I'll tell you, I'll take one thing I'm very proud of. Not a single damn person has ever said to me, prove what you said in the cooking gene, because I already proved it. And I dare them to come at me, come for me. I didn't send for you, but come for me anyway. So you have to have that mentality. It's that, it's that, it's that black, it's this African-American studies mentality of academic excellence, social responsibility, and inherent creativity to, to bring it all together. You need your scholars, you need your food writers. We don't have enough of them. We don't have enough black newspapers where we have a dedicated food column or wine column or nutrition column or any of these things. We need to value this more. We need to value it above. We need to focus, we need to pr promote more black farmers, promote more black sommeliers, promote more black nutritionists, promote more black agronomists, promote more black food scholars. Because we have our own expertise. And we, have, we, we shouldn't be just called up two weeks before Juneteenth and two weeks into Black History Month. That's all I got. Oh, wait, before you jump on that, because I'm going to answer his question. Yeah, come on. Come on. Shrimp and grits. You know when you taste that $34, you know there's no story. You know, you know when, you, when you're like, I'm going to do it because I did it this weekend, I did some of that this weekend, and I already knew the story wasn't there. I already knew the ancestors weren't with me when that, when that happened. It got cold. It got cold real quick in the room. Mm. So do we need to reclaim it? Is it a fad? Is it not? Like he said, we have our own stories, because I tell you for damn sure if I'm going to pay $34 for grits or if I'm making $34 for grits, you ain't going home hungry. You're going to go home with hospitality. You're going to go home with a full belly and probably a piece of cake wrapped in a foil and for you to go home with. Yes, yes. So, you know, it may be a fad. It may be something that we see right now, but then it's going to do with this decline. But we're always going to be here. And, and, and I'm going to piggyback on that for one more second. I know we got to kind of wrap it up. So you know how you know somebody, but you don't, you don't know them, know them. So I read the story about Michael Twitty and the African bird pepper 15, 16 years ago. And I call myself finding him because I'm, I'm like Lander of Seeds. I'm, a, I'm going for, I called 20, 30 people, companies, seed companies. Look, I'm trying to find this African bird pepper. That's this dude said he was riding in a car with somebody talking about African bird pepper, they're now carrying it. And then I order, this was 2010, 11, 2011, I ordered the African uh, seed collection. So that's a, dec that's a decade ago, right? I literally still didn't know, who, I had never seen a picture of a Michael Twitty. I get a call from a Michael Twitty and I'm like, hello? Yeah, um, I understand you on a Georgia Centennial family farm. I was like, I was like, uh, I called my sister. I, hey, I think I was talking to the dude that started this African seed collection. And he's coming to the farm. My sister was like, oh, my God, wait, the bird. So I took these bird peppers all the way to California to try to grow them while I was in California at UC Santa Cruz. So I'm going to school learning and I'm now I'm connected writing back to someone I don't know saying I don't understand why this won't grow I'm trying to do blah 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 and then it hit me I'm trying to grow things that do not grow in this climate I'm trying to grow things that don't even exist anywhere within this climate the African bird pepper specifically needs a certain amount of heat Y'all will never have enough heat up here to grow a true African bird pepper. Because right now you're getting ready to go through a fluctuation, 90 degrees, everybody was so hot today. Y'all ain't hot. Y'all need to come to Georgia and hang out with me for a second. Um, or Texas, deep Texas, like El Paso. Um, but that pepper, when I took it to Brunswick and grew it the very first time, Bush was almost this high and had so many peppers on it. Yeah, just beautiful. 
And I was like, okay, I did the exact same thing when I was in California and the plant never four months later was no taller than that and had like four little peppers on. So that's that other thing about us understanding communally what we can do is also understand where we come from, where we're living now. Like imagine how long it truly took sweet potatoes to make it all the way up north being grown because they too need a warm climate. They can be kept all winter, but they need a warm climate. So that's why like you all in New York are barely getting tomatoes where our tomatoes are finishing up for the first part because it's supposed to be grown before 4th of July, just like corn. Y'all will never get no corn up because it's a different place. So African-Americans have been known or people of African descent have been known to be so resilient that when we go to a place, migrate to a place, take into a place, we quickly identify what's going on in that area and jump right in and figure out, okay, I can't grow this, but I can grow that. That's why the yam became sweet potato. We knew that there was this thing. So innately within our DNA, there's this construct of, okay, I need to pivot. I need to make this happen. I need to do blah, 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 blah. So those of us that are in this uh, food world is what I wanna claim for us is academics, writers, farmers, amazing cooks, chefs, caterers. And that's just like scratching the little bitty surface. We ain't even talking about the fam use and the Fort Valley states where we have our agronomists, where we have people working on robotics for big giant tractors and stuff like that. So we are doing those things. Um, and, and it's not going to stop as long as we continue to have this conversation. And I thank MoFAD for having us to be able to speak on it. Well, you just closed us out. No, I, didn't, I didn't close I didn't this no out. Job. I was just saying, I, me, yeah, I was like, I ain't as got, an individual. I don't have a job no more. No, no, you got the job <laughs> still. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I want to thank y'all so much for coming tonight. I want to thank my wonderful brothers again for being here and speaking the truth. Um, I think we are going to do some book signings, correct? You want to, oh, I'm sorry, do you want to tell everybody what we're doing? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Adrian. Um, give it up for them. Matthew, Michael, Adrian, three of the, the best cooks in the country, thinkers, writers, and people in, in the whole country. I am so, so honored to be in this room with you. Thank you so much for coming here tonight. I really like genuinely love each of you so much. Thank you. Matthew, how long have we been talking about this tonight? I think this the, night. it was funny because when he said 2019, I was like, yeah, it's been like three years. We have. It's been almost yeah. four years that we've been talking about coming and doing something like we this. We were interrupted by a pandemic. Yeah, like, the pandemic. It's so beautiful to have this night happen. In, yeah, in, it is. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Um, yes, yeah, so we're going to have some, some books available for you to uh, buy from the lovely Bem sisters right over here. And I have pens for you to sign. Um, there's gonna be some food from Field Trip. Thank you so much, Field Trip. There's veggie rice bowls. There's some wine, some beer, some uh, Vita Coco and Topo Chico. So enjoy, buy books. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us.